Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We begin today talking about insects in winter crops or the lack thereof, as the case may be for now. Here's SUNUP's Dave Deacon and our extension entomologist, Tom Royer. Here it is, we're wrapping up April and really this is the first time we've had you on to talk about insects in winter crops. Tom, what's going on? Well, we can talk about the lack of insects in winter crops right now. Uh, I was at a couple of canola field day meetings yesterday. Uh, that crop looks beautiful. It's the best I've seen in years. And as I was inspecting it, it was hard for me to find any insects of any kind feeding on it. Um, and the same is true. We're going to be starting our wheat tours in the next few days as well. Uh, really haven't seen a lot of uh, insect activity there. I, I always caution them to, to continue to inspect their crop, make sure that they don't get surprised by something, but so far so good. What I think has happened is we've just had beautiful growing conditions, wet, cool, fall, spring, mm -hmm. and it, uh, things like diamondback moth that will get into canola uh, tend to do a little better when we have a mild winter and probably kind of a drier winter. But at least for right now, things look great. So with all that, with the, with the winter crops looking so well, should producers start thinking about summer crops? Absolutely. Uh, in, in the cases of wheat or canola, uh, a lot of times they can come in with a crop afterwards and plant it. Uh, there, there should be some intentions on planting sorghum this year. Mm -hmm. Obviously there's going to be a lot of cotton, but one of the good things that we've seen about sorghum over the last few years is that, uh, that uh, we've got tools in place to manage sugarcane aphid, mm -hmm. uh, so it's not a big deal anymore like it was back in 2013 to 15. So um, we've got tolerant varieties, we've got some insecticides that can control them when it's needed, um, and farmers are more experienced with it, so they're not uh, afraid of it anymore like they were for a while where we could see such disasters. With the winter crops, if insects do make their way back in, when, when is it too late to, to, to spray for those? Uh, well, with, with armyworm, it's not too late, even as the, the heads are filling mm -hmm. um, with things like that. Um, and with canola, the same kind of issues could happen um, with uh, af after the pods are, are uh, filled out and the, mm -hmm. and the flowers are, flowering's done. Uh, we have seen in the past, that may, actually kind of a year like this, where variegated cutworm came in and started feeding on the pods mm -hmm. pretty seriously. So. Um, you know, these crops aren't out of the woods yet, but uh, there's definitely pot potential and there's definitely a reason for producers to, to watch the crop and protect it if they need to. So what kind of resources are available for the producers when it comes to identifying those insects? Well, of course, we, we make recommendations that we update annually uh, for insecticide products that are registered. But uh, I've also in the last couple of years developed a fact sheet on caterpillars in canola, mm -hmm. caterpillars in uh, small grains, aphids in canola, and just finishing what, one up for aphids in small grains that talks about their biology and everything, but also how to scout for them. Okay, we'll keep an eye out for that. And you can go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu, for more information about those fact sheets. County now, where we stopped along with producers on the canola field tour to learn more about Oklahoma's most colorful crop. So this, this is uh, one of my farms. We're having a, a canola field day here. This is variety trial and uh, experimental trial for Kansas State Breeding Program, as well as the Oklahoma State University Variety Trials. I've partnered with both organizations for, for years to have variety trials out on my land so that we can test and see what varieties work in different areas of the state. We have some excellent variety plots to look at this year. And that goes to say with the same with the canola crop itself in the Southern Great Plains. Uh, it's been an excellent year. It's been a few years since we came out of winter with this good of moisture that really let that canola crop get off and going. The biggest downside to canola this year is that we just didn't have the acres that we intended for at planting time. So with the winter canola filters, it's an excellent a venue for canola producers or producers just thinking about growing canola. They get some 
hands-on experience with the crop. If they have questions, we have a lot of state specialists here. The other good thing about the field day is it gets us out of our office and looking at our plots and we see what's going on in the real world and, and get a lot of questions from farmers where in, in a meeting setting, they may not want to ask certain questions in front of other people, but you get them in a small group in a field setting. We learn, we learn a lot as well as, as the growers. So I was one of the first 10 guys that ever grew it in the state. It's been a great tool for uh, rotating with, with winter wheat, help clean up the feral rye, the cheats, all these brome species of grasses, increases the quality of our wheat, increases our yield, so we still go back to what this crop was brought here for originally. It was a, a herbicide. I mean, it's a growing herbicide because we could come in and use different chemistries to clean up our wheat. Oklahoma's wheat acres have, have dropped from you know, 8 million down to 4.5, 5 million. I'm not even sure where they're at this year. But we've seen a dramatic loss of wheat acreage. I think a lot of the reasoning behind that is because weed control. We've got all these grassy weeds that are uncontrollable in conventional wheat systems that this crop allows you to clean up. So one of the, one of the big issues that uh, back in 02, 03 when I started, nobody knew anything. Uh, so, you know, it was a really steep learning curve. We tried to talk to people in North Dakota, Minnesota, where they've been growing the crop for years. We talked with people from Canada where spring canola has been grown for, you know, 40, 50 years now. There was not a correlation between the spring varieties and the winter varieties. And so I went through a, like I said, a very steep learning curve. I, I always tell people I've messed this crop up any way that you can think of, but I learned from it. And being able to share that with other producers around the state has, has been a great benefit, help them be more successful and spread the crop throughout the state. As, as I said before, it is drastically needed in Oklahoma. Wesley with your weekly Mesonet weather report. We continue to be blessed with rainfall this calendar year. In fact, if we look at the statewide cumulative rainfall since the first of the year, shown here by the dark line, and compare it to the long-term average represented in the blue fill area, we see the state as a whole continues its four-month run ahead of schedule. Rain this week dropped measurable amounts statewide and a whopping 5.8 inches at Hobart. Following closely behind was Mangum with 4.6 inches of rain. Turning now to soil moisture, we see this week's rain made a marketable improvement at a few locations but is worsening quickly in the panhandle. The 4-inch fractional water index on April the 17th showed dry soil conditions in Kay and Texas counties, along with slightly dry conditions near Altus and in the northwest. A week later on April the 24th, the 4-inch soil moisture is reading full at Altus and most of the northwest counties. It is also much improved in the north central region. However, the panhandle has lost soil moisture over the week due to limited rain and high winds. The National Weather Service forecast for the first week of May shows the wet streak is likely to continue with above average chances of rain. Gary will now tell us more about longer term rainfall patterns. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well I don't have a U.S. drought monitor map to show you because we don't have drought in the state. We don't even have abnormally dry conditions, but that doesn't mean we're out of the woods just yet. Let's take a look at the Mesonet rainfall maps and see where we might be in a little bit of trouble. Now, as Wes showed you, we did get a pretty timely rainfall up across uh, north central Oklahoma. Uh, that alleviated some of our concerns for that area, even though if you look at the last 30 days, we do see that area is still about 50% uh, below normal. Um, but that rainfall we had this week did stop our concerns there for at least a week or two. Now, the panhandle, however, it's getting pretty dry. We see in the uh, percent of normal rainfall map that they are less than 25 percent of normal in some areas and less than a third percent of normal in all areas. Uh, and we again we see those dry areas 
as we go over to north central and northeast Oklahoma. Uh, those are our problem areas and those are the areas that need rainfall. Now the saving grace for the panhandle is some of the previous moisture they received. If we go to the growing season to date, the growing season starts on March 1st, we see the panhandle, at least some of it is above normal. So they do have some reserves of moisture. Uh, of course they do need more. But then if you go over to northeast Oklahoma, north central Oklahoma, centering around Osage County, that's an area that continues with those deficits. Again, the, the, the timely moisture this past week did help in that area. We were going to ask for abnormally dry conditions on the drought monitor map, but that alleviated those concerns, at least for this week and maybe a couple of weeks. Those areas will need some rainfall in the next couple of weeks to stop from being labeled on the drought monitor map. So let's hope we get some moisture in here in those select areas. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. Kim, you look just a little bit different than the last time we saw you. Yeah, I've really enjoyed this left arm for uh, most of my life, and I've used it well, and I guess I used it up. The good news is, is that with today's medical uh, technology, they fixed it. You give me another six months, I'm going to be back and good as new. That's great to hear. We're glad you're on the mend. Well, let's talk about grain prices. They continue to decline and harvest forward contract prices are now below $4. Let's talk about what's going on. Well, I'd say grain prices is kind of like this shoulder. They're in the tank right now, but I think there's some potential ahead. Uh, you go back to February, you could forward contract wheat in Oklahoma for de harvest delivery for $4.90. Uh, this week it was below $4, $3.97, down in the mid three three ninety fives there. Uh, you look at Russia, you, you go back to February, you know, we were talking about they were going to run out of wheat for exports. They're still exporting wheat. We talked about their uh, production for the 19-20 uh, uh, marketing year was probably going to be around 2.5 billion bushels. Well, they're still shipping wheat. Uh, you look at their production, it's up to around uh, 2.8, uh, yeah, 2.85 billion bushels. I, I mean, the way the weather's going in the Soviet Union, the way their crop uh, uh, looks, uh, we may be, and I think the market's anticipating our fear of a 3.1 billion bushel crop, another one of those. You look at the value of the dollar on the market, back in February, uh, 94.8, now it's 97.8, so that makes our wheat uh, more expensive. Uh, it's came out this week, Iraq's production is projected to be higher, they'll import less. I mean, you can just go around the world and the importers' uh, crops look good. Uh, you know, we've talked about competition exporting out of Romania, out of, out of Pakistan and other countries like that. Well, considering all that's happened in the last couple of months, um, is it all adding up? Is it logical? That's a big question. Yes and no. The, the big deal is the market has changed. We've got the, black, the, the impact of the Black Sea of Russia, Ukraine, the, the impact of increased production in what we used to call the third world or your importing countries, increased production in Pakistan, India, you know, record crop in India, they would probably be exporting. The market has changed and so those numbers do add up. However, they don't add up a minus a dollar on our crop. There, I think there's just more going on. And a problem, what may be going on there is that we're expecting a big crop. The producers and, and the merchandisers tell me they think test weight's gonna be good. I think the market may be concerned about our protein as we come into harvest. I think possibly protein may be another key as we come in. If we got that 12.5 protein, I think that price may end up uh, increased because we gotta have the 12.5 to export it next year. If we don't have protein, then prices will probably stay where they are. Okay, Kim, thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. Oklahoma's wheat crop is really coming along now. Joining us to talk a little bit about it is our extension wheat pathologist, Bob Hunger. Bob, you and the team have been out and about around the state. What are you seeing and hearing this year or maybe not seeing and hearing? Yeah, I think the, the not seeing, not hearing is the, the first part I'd like to talk about because uh, uh, by this time, the last several years, uh, wheat streak mosaic virus had, had been a, a big disease that uh, had been hitting across the state. And to date, uh, we've gotten a number of samples in the lab, but only one of them has been positive for wheat streak. And there's been far, far fewer samples uh, 
last year I think it was in the 80s somewhere that we had the last couple years and this year maybe there's been eight or ten samples and only one positive for wheat streak so that virus is is much uh, less than than typical for the last couple years and probably that has a lot to do with the planting date the wheat was planted much later so there wasn't much time for the curl mites to infect the wheat Barley yellow dwarf, kind of the same thing. We are starting to see some spots of barley yellow dwarf scattered around in fields, and there are some reports of aphids, but uh, that has been less too, and that's probably been a spring infestation of aphids, so uh, much not going to be near as damaging as it could be. What are we seeing, or again, not seeing, in terms of rust this year? Well, the foliar diseases have <clears throat> been a little bit of an enigma this year, uh, starting with powdery mildew. I would have expected there to be a lot of powdery mildew across the state and there's been very little of that. Uh, we have found it, it's not totally absent, but it's not been a, a factor at all uh, as it sometimes can be and we've had the right weather for it, but it just hasn't been there. Early in the season, uh, far southern Texas, there was uh, quite a bit of leaf rust in particular, but also some stripe rust. Uh, but after reports coming in March and maybe very early April. Uh, I have not gotten any reports from Texas about rust continuing to move north across Texas. So I'm thinking maybe for whatever the reasons, it seems to me they've had fairly wet weather down there as well, but the inoculums maybe just not as at high a level as it has been in other years. And then what uh, uh, is a bit more puzzling is that this last week there was a report from Kansas, not in that first tier of counties across the Oklahoma-Kansas border, but in the second tier of counties they've uh, found fairly widespread uh, leaf rust and stripe rust in those counties. Not extremely heavy, but it has been found there. Last but not least, you and, and our Extension and Research colleagues are, are doing a lot of traveling this time of year with field days, so those are coming up. Right. Yeah, the field days got started uh, this week, and then next week they take off in a big way through, through the months of May, uh, through the month of May, especially uh, early parts, but really th for the whole month. And I know we all look forward to those. Well, Bob, good talking to you, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot. And for a link to all the upcoming field days, just go to sunup.okstate.edu. For those cow-calf producers across Oklahoma that are going to use or already using artificial insemination during this upcoming uh, spring breeding season, I think one of the key items is the timing of that artificial insemination as compared to when you first see the cow in standing estrus or standing heat. You see, for years we used to talk about an AM-PM rule and that is that if we saw a cow in standing estrus in the morning, we would breed her that evening, or if we saw her that evening, then breed her the following morning. Much more recent data with large numbers in the dairy cattle business has indicated that it's not necessary to have those two different times of artificial insemination, that we can, if we see the cow first in heat in the morning, we can breed her the following morning, or if we see her in the evening, we can again breed her in the following morning, doing all of our artificial insemination in the morning. Another key reason why I think that's so important is here in Oklahoma, as we get into May and June and start to get into those warmer summer days, that being able to do artificial insemination in the cooler times of the day is important in terms of increasing the percentage of these cattle that we actually get pregnant to artificial insemination. Data done here at OSU and published back in 2011 shows us that during the course of the day, as the hours go into late afternoon and the temperatures rise, that it's actually two to five hours after the peak of outside temperature that the uh, body temperature of these cattle reaches their peak. So, if we've got a hot afternoon, say at four or five o'clock in the afternoon, the peak of the body temperature of the cow may be in the early evening to around 10 o'clock. That tells me that we want to avoid those times to do our artificial insemination 
because elevated body temperature will have an adverse effect on fertility. So again, I think what we want to do during this upcoming breeding season, or any breeding season, is to do AI in the morning hours, if at all possible. So if we see her in heat this morning, let's wait until tomorrow morning when that cow has a chance to have her body temperature back down to in a more normal range when we actually do insemination. I think we'll have a higher uh, breeding percentage and more success with our AI program. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SunUp's Cow-Calf Corner. The April Cattle on Feed report came out just a couple days ago, and, and Daryl, were there any big surprises in the report? Not too big of surprises, although the, the uh, placements for March came in a little bit bigger than expected, mm -hmm. about 4.8% higher than last year. Um, marketings for the month of March were down about 3.4%. Uh, however, we have to keep in mind that the, uh, th this March had one less business day compared to a year ago. So on a daily average basis, they were actually slightly higher than last year. Uh, those two things led to an on-feed total for April 1 that was up 2% from one year ago. So the larger placements, is that gonna cause a problem as we move on in through the year? Well, again, I don't know if the trade will react a little bit negatively to it. I wouldn't think too much. Um, you know, we had bigger placements this month. We had a little bit bigger placements year over year last month, but the five months prior to that, they were actually down. So if you look at the first three months of this year, placements are just like a half a percent bigger than last year. Most of those placements were in lighter weight cattle under 700 pounds. So they're not gonna hit until mid year and later for the most part. And so I think we're, we're probably spreading out these cattle enough to not uh, really have any major problems from it. I can't believe that we're already in the second quarter of 2019, <laughs> where the, which means that the Q1 numbers came out in there. Were there any big surprises in those numbers? You know, the April 1st quarterly numbers in the cattle on feed report uh, gives us a breakdown of steers and heifers. We watched that. Um, the, the steers were down for the, you know, for the second quarter in a row. Uh, steers were down about 1.1% compared to uh, a year ago. The heifers are, are above a year ago and have been for several quarters now. They were about 7.7% uh, above a year ago. As you look at these numbers and you look at the proportion of heifers to steers in the, in the total mix of things, um, it's pretty clear we're slowing down heifer retention. Uh, heifers as a percent of steers and heifers on feed, the total is, is up to about 37%. That would suggest that we're, you know, again, we're, we're not uh, keeping as many heifers for breeding. It's, it's more confirmation that we're slowing down this herd expansion. What are you seeing as far as fed cattle prices and feeder cattle as we move through April? You know, on the basis of this supply situation that we have, we've had some weather disruptions. Fed cattle prices are, have actually kind of done a double top this spring. Mm -hmm. We had a peak in March. I thought there was a chance we might come back and touch it again, and it appears that we have. We've still got carcass weights lighter than a year ago. And so, you know, there's, we're extending this, this seasonal uh, spring top a little bit. Uh, feeder cattle, kind of the same story. We've, uh, we may have peaked in late March, uh, but we're extending that support. Uh, we've got lots of green grass coming on. We've got the best forage conditions we've had in a lot of years. We have zero drought in Oklahoma right now uh, and really in much of the country. So uh, good forage conditions. Uh, we're holding good support for these feeder cattle prices as we go into green grass season. Okay, thank you much, Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Finally today, we all know the important role that first responders play in our communities. And for some emergencies, they're called upon to rescue livestock, which takes another level of training, as we found out in Noble County. So we started this in, in 2017, and the idea kind of centered around law enforcement and getting people more used to animals and animal agriculture. A lot of our law enforcement officials don't come from an agriculture background or don't come from an animal background, yet they are exactly who are going to be called when somebody sees animals loose on the highway. If there's a disaster, our first responders are going to be there. But we can't just assume that they have the skill set to handle the animals safely um, and take you know, consideration of their behavior into account. Um, and again, it's directed towards cattle and equine because of Oklahoma, we're a big horse and cattle state. Uh, and that's our goal is really just to help people that don't have that ag background, but are going to be involved. And even for our volunteers through Oklahoma Medical Reserve Corps, people that care about animals and want to help um, during these situations, well, they need to be properly trained and how to do things safely and effectively. I think it's important just for the safety of other people because if you have a little bit of background knowledge and you uh, go out and, and understand all of this, 
you may save somebody's life on the highway or a, you know a turnover uh, cattle truck on the road or loose animals in a neighborhood you're just you're just uh, more informed and better educated about what to do with them and how to handle them most people get excited during these scenarios their adrenaline gets up that only adds more stress to the animal who is already stressed and everybody's doing things too quickly and fast and we really want to promote the idea that if you understand animal behavior, if you know how to do things calmly, um, it's actually easier and faster to get the animals to safety. Incidences involving animals are frequent and can happen in Tulsa, in Oklahoma City, as well as in Woodward. And so we want our public officials and our first responders and people that volunteer to have the skill set to be able to help animal agriculture. I'm used to handling animals, uh, grew up around animals, but I thought this was very informative. Uh, it was a great class and I would recommend it for anybody to, to get a hold of the, their extension uh, departments or county extension offices and uh, try to get a hold of some of this information. And that'll do it for us this week. Remember you can find us anytime on our website sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and our social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.